We're talking of children, but we have to spend a moment to pray for those who are married, but they have a new problem. What's it? They don't have kids. That is your Jannah. Your sabr is your Jannah. Your patience is your Jannah. There are so many from amongst us whom Allah has blessed with a beautiful, loving spouse, but unfortunately no children. Do you accept that as what Allah has chosen for you? Accepting what Allah has chosen for you does not mean that you shouldn't try whatever you have to or can medically and other halal ways to get the children, to conceive, for example. It's permissible. You should try. There's no harm. Beyond a certain point, you might find it's a small medical matter. It may be. So your trial is also an ibadah. It's an act of worship. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ has told us that it is part of the plan of Allah to want us to reproduce. So we have to spend a moment dedicating or dedicated to those who don't have offspring. May Allah bless you with offspring. May Allah grant you sabr. I've become very sensitive to ask married couples, do you have kids? Sometimes that question if they've been trying for 10, 15, 20 years, it becomes a point of sadness within the heart. So I've become a little bit sensitive. I try to ask the least questions. Unless I'm very close to you, then I would know. Some of us have been blessed with offspring, both boys and girls. So someone says, how many children do you have? And you might just say, so many boys, so many girls. Can I tell you how many I have? You want to know? MashaAllah, seven girls. MashaAllah, and two boys. We thank Allah for that. We thank Allah for that. I know one of my colleagues, he had a daughter and then another daughter and a third daughter and a fourth daughter and a fifth daughter and a sixth daughter and a seventh daughter and an eighth daughter and a ninth daughter and a tenth daughter and an eleventh daughter and a twelfth daughter and a thirteenth daughter and they were just daughters. MashaAllah. His name is... Sheikh Asim al-Hakim. Grant him goodness. You might have heard that name, right? But Allah blessed him. He's blessed. And so are we. When you have males alone, you are blessed. When you have females alone, you are blessed. When you have male and female, you are blessed. And when you have neither male nor female, you are blessed in ways that perhaps you have not yet understood. Allah might have chosen you for something far greater. Go out and search. What's the purpose? What is it? Don't be angry and upset with Allah. So the reason why I'm actually spending a lot of time on this is because, and I told the organizers, by the way, that since there's no Q&A, and since it's the last talk, and since the people have come from the morning right up to now, please let me talk. Don't give me a time limit. So I promise you, my brothers and sisters, people complain when they have boys only. People complain when they have girls only. People complain when they don't have kids. And when they, when they have both boys and girls, guess what they're doing? They're complaining, ah, these kids of mine. So who is thanking Allah? Who is thanking Allah? Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. Remember when I started, I, everything is from Allah and we praise Him upon all conditions. This is what it is. On the day of judgment, a caller will call. Where are those who used to praise Allah? Whether it was happiness or sadness, they still praised Allah. They will be given a VIP treatment. Because they praised Allah. In sickness, they praised Allah. We all have to get sick. Have you thought about something? A flu. You know the normal flu that we have. It is sometimes seasonal. It comes back every year. Why? Some of us are healthier, maybe every two years, maybe a little bit more or less. A guy like me with a weak immune system, I thank Allah. It happens much more often. But alhamdulillah, we thank Allah. Why does Allah make us go through that every... To, to realize how powerful He is and how weak we are. No matter who you are, small droplet infection can actually make you bedridden for two weeks. And you are a powerful person, subhanallah. To show you, man, you are actually very, 
very, very insignificant compared to Allah. Just thank Allah. Thank Allah. Let that be an opportunity of gaining closeness to Allah. Now let's get to those whom Allah blesses with children. Number one, I firmly believe that as you get married and you've chosen a good spouse and mashallah, you've made the right decisions and you've looked at the guidance from Allah and now you're married, it doesn't mean you need to have children ASAP. As soon as possible, we're going to have offspring. If you've chosen that in an enlightened fashion, Alhamdulillah. And if it has happened from Allah, Alhamdulillah. But if you could, I'd rather you actually gave it a little bit of a break to get to know one another a little bit better. This advice would not have been given to you a few decades back, but now it is. Because we are facing thousands, if not millions of children of divorced couples, broken homes who are struggling, who've lost the path completely. And it was quite simple to wait. When I look at them, they were normally and usually born within the first year of marriage, sometimes the next. Why didn't you just wait a while? I need to make sure that I really believe this person is deserving to be the father of my kids or the mother of my kids. It's not haram from an Islamic perspective. No, not at all. Especially when you see the result of the mistakes people are making. They have one kid, two, three, four, and after that, everything is gone. What happened? You kept her pregnant. Why? For whatever reason. It's not prohibited. But why did you bring in kids when you knew there was something wrong with your relationship or you were not yet 100% certain of it? It's not wrong. You cannot speak about raising an ummah without advising couples to say, be careful, hold on, relax. Don't just be so quick. I remember recently I attended a wedding. At that wedding, I met the, the groom. I gave him a hug. And I told him, may Allah bless you with offspring. He told me, not just yet. I told him, why? We're learning, right? He said, I want to travel the world. I want to enjoy life, just me and her. And perhaps after five, ten years, we'll have kids. I told him, and how do you know that you're going to have a life that will span beyond or up to that five or ten years? How do you know? What, why did I ask him the question, how do you know? Because, because I wanted him to correct that slightly to say, that inshallah, I'd like to wait until I'm 100% certain, rather than making it a dunya and a worldly reason to say, I want to see the world. You can see the world with your kids. That's just an excuse. Because daddy don't want to help mommy anymore. So he says, well, once we have kids, I'm sorry, you, we can't travel because you know, now it's a stress. Dad, the day you can take the baby, your own baby in your hands and tell your wife, Please have a lovely, lovely sleep. I will take the baby and go into the next room to ensure that you have a great sleep because tomorrow is a Sunday and I don't have to go to work and I'll make you the breakfast and bring it for you. That's the day you have the happiest home. You have taught generations and people around you realizing that I am also a father as much as she is a mother. It doesn't mean that she has to do X, Y, and Z. I know of people, subhanallah, as much as we as Muslims are taught not to mix our roles. Definitely, that's there. We don't mix our roles, but show me an Islamic evidence that tells you that as a man, there's no role for you to play in the upbringing of the child. It's only to do with the mother. Where is that? Show me the hadith. Show me the verse of the Quran. It's not there. Because parents, it's your responsibility in a joint fashion. And one of the reasons that we are struggling, not only the divorce and the broken homes of people who want to have kids so quickly without realizing that it's my responsibility to this innocent child to make sure that if I wasn't 100% certain in my own way with my spouse, I shouldn't have brought that child. Number one. Number two is, if you have the children, learn to soften up towards your spouse. Because you know what? 
it's not about you. Don't be selfish. We have people who say, I want to divorce her. Or, I need a divorce. My husband is a bad man. How many kids do you have? Seven. I'm fed up. Seven kids. Seven kids. And now you realize he's a bad man. Subhanallah. Why don't you think for a moment? And it, I'm not talking only about the women, but it happens with the men as well. She's born seven kids for you. And you say, I want to divorce her. Why? Ah, she's a 1960 model, you know. Now there's the millennials, you know. It's totally different, you know. That ride in the Lexus is far smoother, you know. A'udhu Billah. What are you talking about? Do you have a brain? Do you realize it's not about you, your pleasure, your enjoyment, and only yourself? Now it's about children who are there, who you brought onto earth with the decree of Allah. And it's your duty to make sure you have sacrificed a little bit more to ensure they have a reasonable, decent life. Have you ever watched people run the race? The 100 meter relay, the 400 meter relay they call it. 100 meters each and you pass the baton and you pass the baton. I promise you my brothers, my sisters, in life we are called Khalifa. The term Khalifa means those who come one after the other. I am supposed to have gotten a baton from my parents and I'm supposed to hand it over to my children and they're supposed to give it to their children. That baton has the torch of the deen, subhanallah. I'm supposed to hand it and this is when I fulfill part of my duty unto Allah regarding why I'm on earth, subhanallah. So if I just say, I don't want this marriage anymore, what did I do to the baton? You're running the relay halfway, you look at, what was his name? Hussein Bolt. You look at him and you say, ah, it's okay. I'll leave the baton, I'm going away. Why are we going to lose anyway? He might run in a way that it will win. You may have children through whom Allah will grant you Jannah because of their dua, because of their goodness, because of the fact that you sacrificed, you wanted to see them succeed even though you didn't achieve what they have. And you couldn't have achieved it for whatever reason, maybe. But because you looked at the broader picture and you were not selfish, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely let you taste the fruits of your sacrifice if not in the dunya, then in the akhirah. And if you are fortunate, then in both. So if you are going to have children, remember, you need to sacrifice as parents. I was speaking about the point that the fathers also need to contribute in the marriage. The last time I was in Nigeria, in fact, not just the last time, but some time back, I asked a few brothers, have you ever changed a nappy of your kid? Talking of marriage. Nappy? What nappy? Nappy. I'm not saying it's your job, but I challenge you, have you ever done it? If you haven't, your fatherhood skills are not complete. We're only talking of skills. I'm not saying it's your job. My sisters, I'm not encouraging you to say, did you hear the talk today? There's, there's the nappy. This is something called wet wipes. This is something else. Go for it. And when he's done, you inspect it and say, ah, four out of ten. Try again tomorrow morning. And then midnight, you get him up. Forget about tomorrow morning. It's happened. Do it again. I'm not encouraging you to do that. No. Let's not abuse religion. Let's not abuse things. But what I am saying, let's be conscious of one another. Let's love one another. Let's show that mawadda and rahma. You know what that means? When you're married, Allah says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Allah has placed between you mawadda and rahma. The love and the mercy. Mawadda is one of the highest levels of love. Allah didn't say hub. Allah says, Mawadda. Mawadda is a closeness and intimacy. That love that is filled with the highest level of affection, the care. And Rahma means mercy. That's the wife. That's my, the mother of my children. Subhanallah, there is a Rahma. I feel the mercy. Part of the Rahma, isn't it that when you see her struggling, you can say, don't worry. Tonight, I'm on guard. That's what I'm saying. It's Rahma. 
So some people say, how come I'm married? Allah promises us mawadda and rahma. I feel neither mawadda nor rahma. Can I tell you one of the diagnoses? Because perhaps we're involved in sin. That's why. One of the reasons. Perhaps we have unplugged from Allah. Sins generally are of two types. One is, you're not doing what is compulsory. And two is, you're doing what is prohibited. Two things. So my brothers, my sisters, we don't feel the love because we're involved with another woman. That's why. So now you come home, you don't see the mother of your children as the mother of your children anymore. You see her as, ah, this lady is five kilos more than the other one. Wow, five kilos. She gave birth to one child. You are fortunate, subhanallah. I remember a man with a belly, big belly. You know the men after the age of a certain age, maybe 35, 40, sometimes more, sometimes less, they develop a belly, subhanallah. It's the mercy of Allah so that the woman can say, So, the wife, tells his, the wife tells her husband, you know what, you need to lose a bit of weight, look at your belly. So he says, look at yours. She says, I'm pregnant, I'm about to give birth, I'm about to be a mother. He says, well, I'm about to be a father. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We sometimes don't realize that as much as, I'm talking about men, as much as we'd love our wives to be the most good-looking, you need to understand those looks go beyond that which is just physical and outward into the heart. Earlier I heard Sheikh Abdul Fattah say that after 10 years of marriage, then you actually now feel you're married. Did you hear him say that? Why? He worded it differently from what I would word it, but in essence, there comes a stage in your marriage when you begin to appreciate the sacrifice of your spouse if you are fearful of Allah. If you have taqwa and iman in you, if you have a heart, you begin to appreciate what your spouse has sacrificed for you and for this marriage and you get on to a new level of love. At that point, what you look like doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's your sacrifice. I love you. What have you done? You gave up your home. You gave up everything. You gave up your family. You gave up your area. You gave up sometimes your country. You traveled to a different continent. Can't I appreciate you as a spouse? Subhanallah. May Allah bless us. May Allah grant us goodness. My brothers and sisters, these children of ours are an amana from Allah. Just like your life is in the hands of Allah. Just like you wouldn't want your parent to think that they have the right to instruct you to do that which is against the command of Allah. You as a parent should understand the same about your child. The child is an amana. Do you know what the term amana means? Amana means it does not belong to you. Allah allows you to say, my son, my daughter, just for a short space of time. Could you have said that before the child was born? You couldn't because you didn't have the child. Where was the child? With Allah somehow, somewhere. Alam al-arwah, where the arwah were. But you couldn't say, my son, my daughter. Why? They weren't yours at that stage. They were still with Allah. The minute they were born or perhaps conceived, you say, my child. Once they are out in life, you say, my son, my daughter. Whose is that? Not yours. You are allowed to use the word my. At this juncture, yet it does not refer to ownership. Have you thought of that? I remember speaking to a group of people and one of the speakers with us raised an issue. After that, a question was asked. And the sister who asked the question got up and said, you know, my husband, 
my husband. So the, the guy gets up, the speaker says, hang on, hang on, hang on. You have 25% shares in this man. The other 75, you are granted as a gift to enjoy whilst it's not yet there. And I was like, gosh, did you have to say that right now? But I learned a lesson. He was trying to say, when you say my, it's not ownership. It's just a gift of Allah. For a while you can say it. But at some stage, Allah may take that away from you. Allah may take your husband away from you. Allah may take your child away from you. Who gave Allah the right to take my son away at the age of five? How can I even ask that question? It was Allah who gave me in the first place. And I want to tell you, those of you who have lost children, may Allah give you Jannah. Those children will be waiting for you, bi'idhnillah, to fight your case on the day of judgment. May Allah make it easy for us to earn Jannatul Firdaus. I promise you, my beloved brothers and sisters, if you think you have a problem, just go back to the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and read his life and you will find that he didn't lose one child. He didn't lose two children. He lost all his children in his lifetime besides one. Who was that one? Fatima radiallahu anha. She passed away just a few months after him. Have you lost children? If the answer is yes, the best of creation has lost all his children in his lifetime. It's not a sign of the displeasure of Allah. It's not a sign that Allah didn't choose you for something good. No. It could be a sign of the love of Allah. I remember a brother who had several children and he lost a few of them, a few of them in a car crash. And he was so upset. And 10 years later, he told me the amount of trouble that the rest of my kids have given me. I sometimes through my weakness wish that Allah had taken them all away. If I had told him that years before, he would have probably thought I was some Satan. Satan. But he's saying it himself, that I see the wisdom of Allah. Maybe Allah took these kids away because Allah did not want me to struggle with their, with their upbringing. Perhaps. So you don't know, you don't know what Allah has in store, what Allah has planned. You fulfill whatever you have to. But thank Allah. The child belongs to Allah. That's the meaning of amana. Allah will take the child away at any stage. Now I want to give you another example. May Allah take us all for hajj. Say amin. And umrah. Say amin. Again and again. Say amin. MashaAllah. I'm sure one of those amins is accepted. Bi'ithnillah. Okay. If your neighbor was going for hajj, and they were leaving the house and they told you, listen, here are the keys. Please, can you take care of the house? We're going for three weeks. We're going to come back. Do you have the right, once they're gone, to open the house, take the car, start driving, going out, change the paint of the car, come back, change the painting of the house, break a wall, make something else in the kitchen, take something away, put it back. When they come back, they'll say, what happened to this house? Right? We would never do that if we were honest people. We are doing it with our children. Allah gives us and says, look, I'm going to give you. You made dua for a good spouse we gave you. You made dua for children. I'm giving you for a while. I'm going to take this child away. And between now and then, I want you to make sure that you only do what I have told you to do because it's mine, not yours. So from a young age, do not let that child sit with cartoons, with phones. Wallahi, I've had a question that was asked to me not long ago saying, you know what, how can I seek the forgiveness of Allah? Because my three-year-old was watching pornography on my phone. Why? How? I couldn't believe it. But now your three-year-old knows more about your phone than mine. Or than anyone else's, than anything else. Let me word it again. Your three-year-old knows more about your phone than you. They will pick it up. I recall I had put a little finger. You know, there is, there is this uh, 
system of opening your phone with your eye and your finger. At one stage it was the thumb, now it's the eye. And the child says, no, come here. Don't just give me the phone. In your finger, put it here. It's your finger that's going to work here. The children know the pattern on your phone, how to open, what, what not. What? Number one is for a child to access porn at that age, it means it was somewhere in the phone. It was, something was happening. You don't just click on a website. You don't know. But you have pressed either the history or a clip that's happening. Number one, promise Allah that you are going to delete all the clips from your phone that are immoral. Do we promise? What happened? Why are we reluctant? Do we promise Allah that we will delete all the clips from our phones that are immoral? It's still not good enough. So many of you are just silent looking at me like, there's nothing immoral on my phone. Come on, get away. Don't lie. Don't lie. Do you promise Allah? We want children who are going to grow up with high values and we are not prepared to promise Allah that we will have high values. Come on. Do you promise Allah you will delete every clip that is in your phone that is immoral? A little bit better. MashaAllah. May Allah make it easy for us.